Turn on. Tune in. The Satan is a magician. He's not seeking that kind of control. I think the red control, where he thinks the All right, well, let's just uh, do this. Uh, my apologies for uh, finding this out right now. I, I thought demonetization didn't mean they were killing my live streams as well. So I will just upload the interview afterward if, uh, to both channels, if that's all right with you. And uh, sure. we'll, we'll just uh, press forward. Hopefully, we don't have any more technological glitches. Uh, so anyway, this is... Logos Media's Unspun number 157. I'm here with Dr. Shiva Ayadure, and uh, we're going to be discussing the climate of science and Dr. Ayadure's work. And uh, we've got uh, uh, some interesting uh, discussion to go through today. And uh, you are the inventor of email, as well as uh, you've got an interesting uh, background. You're a politician as well. You've tried to run for US Senate. Uh, you are a scientist and you are into health and nutrition and all sorts of things. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to have you on uh, uh, a, guy that, uh, a guy that listens to my show uh, reached out to me. Alan reached out to me uh, asking if I would have you on. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to bring you on the show. Uh, so last week, my channel was demonetized. Apparently, they've demonetized both channels, which I was not aware of. And uh, I thought they had demonetized the primary one. They didn't say anything about uh, shutting down my live stream. But apparently, they've done it to both channels. So, oh boy, you know, free speech. If you are conservative and discuss facts and science, they don't like that out there these days. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Dr. <laughs> How do I say that again? Uh, you can say I, I, Dr. Shiva, <laughs> welcome to the show. And why don't, we, why don't we start off by talking about your educational background? Right. I, I think one way to uh, look at me is I have a, you know, I'm an MIT PhD. I think there's probably a couple thousand people only in the world who have an MIT PhD. And I have four degrees from MIT. But I've been a scientist and an inventor pretty much most of my life since the age of 14, uh, when, as you mentioned, I created the first email system. But that was just the beginning of my work in science and technology. I went off to MIT, did four degrees there uh, during 1981 to 2007. Uh, in fact, I used to teach there. And I started seven different companies across many, many different fields. In fact, the latest company I'm running uh, is worth a couple of billion dollars. It's in the area of biotech uh, pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. Uh, and it's a technology that in many ways, um, uh, if email was the digital version of the office, the new technology I've created, Cytosol, is a digital version of the human cell, or for that matter, any type of cell. And we're using that to eliminate the need for animal testing and discover new medicines faster and cheaper. In fact, about several years ago, we discovered a combination therapy for pancreatic cancer, and we got it allowed by the FDA. And probably by the end of this um, year, we'll probably be filing probably about 20 or 30 different patents uh, in all different kinds of very uh, nonlinear synergistic combinations of medicines, all coming from natural uh, sources. Do you, uh, would you like to get into the history of your invention of email? And I know that uh, you had a, a lot of uh, trouble with that, in fact. You know, and I just checked, it says that the... Uh, that the uh, backup channel, they did not shut off my live stream. So I'm not sure what's going on there either. Oh, okay. That's good. But at least we're recording, so we'll get it out tonight either way. Well, I think that the, what's interesting with the invention of email is it's not really the facts, because the facts are obvious who created it. I called it email, was the one to coin the term. I wrote the first 50,000 lines of code to replicate the entire inner office mail system. Anyone over the age of 40 remembers uh, that the way offices ran was one with the landline phone, and the other one was through what was called a paper-based mail system, 
which involved the secretary being a node in a network where on her desk, a physical desk, she had a inbox and outbox drafts. She had a paper clip, you know, she had a typewriter. She would write these things called memos. Uh, she'd literally make carbon paper. I mean, carbon copies using carbon paper. So if she had to do a, a letter to you and CC 20 people, she'd be typing, you know, at least 19 times. Um, and, you know, they put these memos in it. Uh, let's say I was going to hire you. Um, I would send an email to my superior. I would do an attachment and I would circulate it using the CC field or the forward field to different people and people would respond back. And that's how communications was done in the inner office mail environment. So I and now I remember in 1978, I was only a 14 year old kid working in Newark, New Jersey. I was one of those guys who uh, didn't just play soccer and baseball, but I was also pretty hardcore a mathematics guy by the age of ninth. I had finished calculus and I had the opportunity to go to NYU in a special intensive computer science um, summer program where I learned seven programming languages and um, got a full time job as a research fellow working with people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And I was treated as a, as a you know, a, an equal. And in, this was in Rutgers Medical, what is now known as Rutgers Medical School. And I was asked to convert the entire inner office mail system into the electronic version. And that's what I did, called it email, uh, went off to MIT. When I got to MIT, the president of MIT said, who was at that time the science advisor to Reagan, said it's too bad you can't uh, patent software because the Supreme Court wasn't recognizing it, but you should copyright it according to the Copyright Act, uh, the Computer Software Act of 1980. I did that, and on August 30th, 1982, a young American uh, teenager was given the first U.S. copyright for email, recognizing me legally and officially as the inventor of email. So those are the facts. The issue is, why was there even any controversy? Right. Um, and that's, that's probably the more, I mean, you know, you know, I wrote the code, called it email, and have the first copyright. If patents were allowed, I would have been the first to patent, and I would have been a gazillionaire. But I made money, you know, went off to MIT and I was on the front page of MIT for many, many other things, created uh, many other inventions, but it was only in September uh, of around 2011 when my dear mom was dying of a horrible disease 35 years later, she had saved all of this uh, content, all the artifacts in a beautiful Samsonite suitcase and she gave it to me. And Time Magazine science editor, Doug Ameth, still to this day, the only journalist who actually went through the materials, wrote a wonderful article called The Man Who Invented Email, sharing the facts. Three months later, the Smithsonian um, uh, contacted me and wanted all these materials. It went in on February 16th, 2012, three months later, about a couple months later after my mom died. And uh, a young Washington Post reporter who read the facts wrote a great article in the Washington Post that uh, night called Shivaya Dure honored as the inventor of email. And right after that is when the proverbial shit hits the fan, when it should have been an occasion for celebrating the American dream. I mean, what better person? I came from uh, a lower caste Indian family, poor uh, family, uh, grew up in Patterson and Clifton, worked in Newark, and I created the first email system. But instead, what happened was the white liberals, academics, uh, unleashed hell because during those 35 years, they had redone uh, the fake story, the fake history, uh, of email saying that the military created when they didn't. They had a guy who looked like a nerd who simply did simple text messaging. That's not email. Email is the entire system. And I never claimed to have invented electronic messaging. That goes back to Samuel Morse. I, but I invented email. And over a period of four years, I was called all sorts of horrible names, a fraud, uh, all those four degrees, all my inventions, my Fulbright scholarship didn't matter because what mattered was this very, very a uh, brainwashing narrative, which is all great innovations must come from the military industrial academic complex. And um, what they didn't know was I'd, I'd been an activist most of my life. You know, if there's pictures of me fighting at MIT for all sorts of things. If anything, they could even call me a lefty. And so I put on my activist hat, did the research. We found documents predating 1978. 1970 is when I invented email. Clearly uh, written a military analyst report saying that there was no intention ever to create the electronic version of the inner office mail system because they considered it impossible. In fact, uh, the subtext of that is they considered these young women secretaries, frankly, incapable of using the computer. But what a 14-year-old American kid was trying to do was trying to move the secretaries from the typewriter to the keyboard when the elite academics thought that they were incapable of using the computer. 
So that's what the facts are. Uh, eventually, four years later, I found a great lawyer and we sued Gawker Media and um, a, a Hulk Hogan had sued them, had just won a lawsuit, uh, which was an appeal. I was the second guy to sue them for 35 million and they claimed bankruptcy. The karma and the irony was I was appointed the co-chairman of the bankruptcy committee to sell Gawker to Univision. <laughs> and uh, recently, and recently we settled with another uh, nonsensical blog, which had called me all sorts of names. The facts, the facts really are this, uh, and are, are, I guess not the facts. Uh, the more the underlying issue is, uh, why was there even a controversy, and what does it mean when a, a dehumanizing narrative has taken place that uh, innovation only can occur in Silicon Valley? great innovations or, or places like MIT. The problem that they have is, you know, I got, I earned four degrees at MIT. You know, I didn't say that I was a Native American to get in. I actually earned them. And, um, and, and the invention of an email took place outside of the military industrial complex. And that is what the real issue is. By the way, you know who invented a TV? It was a 14 year old boy working in Franklin, Idaho by the name of Philo Farnsworth. He went through a similar journey. So I think, the deeper issue of the invention of email is really, it's not just about me, but it's the story of every person who, uh, who wants to express being a human being, which is uh, innovation and creativity, period. And the dehumanizing aspect is to say that only after you go to MIT or Silicon Valley can you be a great inventor. Right. And uh, so they didn't want a uh, dark-skinned kid uh, who's an immigrant from India inventing it and taking their glory. Well, yeah, so the thing is, you know, they don't, the, the, the story with me is a little bit different than Philo Farnsworth. Philo Farnsworth was a white kid in a small farm, and you can't have stuff take place in a 600-person farm. It has to occur by RCA. RCA actually stole us. In my case, you have the race issue, because here's a darkie, and it's being done in Newark, and, you know, it's being done outside of the military-industrial complex. So I had three strikes against me. But the issue is that you have to fight for this. And, there, and, and we've been victorious on it. You know, eventually we got close to a million dollar settlement from Gawker, but it's really not the money. The bigger issue is, and we're never gonna give up this fight, uh, sharing the truth is, in, in fact, I was invited by uh, one of the governors of Argentina to, for 10 days, and they were very appreciative of this because it's really the story of the underdog. And it's the story of the fact that innovation can occur anytime, you know, any place by anybody. And, it, and you don't need to go to MIT or to the Silicon Valley uh, elites to be able to say that you're an innovator. So I think it's a deeply important American story. I would agree with you. And uh, what can you say about uh, Wikipedia and uh, their involvement in all of this? Have they tried to cover up uh, the inven invention of this? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a, when I give my presentation, in the middle of 2014, 2015, when this controversy was at its peak, a Wikipedia senior editor wrote to me, he goes, you know, I went through your facts and I attempted to change, the, uh, uh, give you credit. He goes, I was called all sorts of horrible names and essentially uh, said that I was crazy. And if you go to Wikipedia, people have actually gone on there. I mean, you can go look at my site prior to 2012 where I'm in the inventors, uh, uh, inventors I think, Hall of Fame for American Scientists, and all of that gets removed and, and they reduce it to a controversial claim. What's total <laughs> BS? Right. What do you have to be? You have to be a, 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 a you know, do I have to be a blonde haired Jewish kid with blue eyes? Uh, and then I would be on every stamp in the United States. You know, I went to, you know, I, I've traversed all sorts of domains. I've been in, when I first came to this country, I lived in Patterson, all African American, you know, very poor people, Clifton, working class whites. And my last three years, I was in Livingston High School, great high school, great teachers, very dedicated teachers, but predominantly very wealthy Jewish people. And it was interesting, uh, no one in that school ever told me about MIT, you know? My sister and I were the only two Indian kids there. And because the narrative was only Jewish people are the smart people, and I have a lot of Jewish friends, but the narrative is that they're the chosen people and they can only create. And this is a very racist narrative. And so, you know, I, again, I would assert, was I Jewish? Was I blonde haired? Was I, I would be on every stand in yep, the I, world. Yeah. And I that's what we need to look second. at is. I repeat that last sentence. Yeah. I, I, what, I, what I'm saying is that those in power have created segregation in very, very diverse forms. To be an inventor, you have to 
be a certain way. You can't be a, an athlete, right? You can't look strong. You have to look like a nerd. You have to wear glasses. You have to be uh, sort of uh, unhealthy looking. And then you're branded as an inventor. You see what I'm saying? Right. Um, if you want to be an athlete, you must talk like this and blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? And right. you must be sort of dumb, right? Brawn-like, and then you're an athlete. If you want, uh, you see, they've created all sorts of segregation. It's not just about race. So, and only certain people can have the moniker of great in inventors or scientists. You know, in the middle of my uh, controversy, which was completely fabricated, Walter Isaacson, if he, he's the one who wrote the book on Steve Jobs, he was asked to write, in the middle of this controversy, out of nowhere, a book on the innovators of the digital revolution. So 2012 is when this controversy gets manufactured. 2014 is the peak of it. And Isaacson writes a book called The Innovators of the Digital Revolution. Now, don't you think email is part of the digital revolution? It's not even mentioned. Right. For that matter, it's, it's all white people in there. I have nothing against white people. Most of my friends are white people, okay? But yeah. you're, are, we, are we trying to say that no black person, no brown person, no uh, 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 you know, uh, yellow skin person has invented anything to support the digital revolution? And that's Walter Isaacson, who is, uh, I think, on the board of the Aspen Institute, your elite white liberal institute. So I would argue the most racist people on the planet are white liberals, period. I would and agree with you. And, the, and, the, and then what they do is they cast the blame on all of the uh, conservatives as, as, you know, us being the uh, racist ones. But yeah, yeah I would Malcolm agree with you. Malcolm X brought this up. Malcolm X said, you know, you have the Southern people tell you whatever they want to call you. But he goes, it's the Northern wolves, as he called the white liberals. Right. And Elizabeth Warren is part of that. Harvard University is part of that. And Absolutely. these Northern wolves, who are the real white liberals, think they're the ones who are going to, they're the ones who are going to anoint who's an inventor or who's an innovator. Now, and, and, uh, the, and the truth and the facts. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I just wanted, wanted to say, you know, with uh, Wikipedia, I've had my own experience with them. I do a lot of forensic research and I've investigated the history of the 60s psychedelic counterculture and the so-called inventor of magic mushrooms or the so-called discoverer of magic mushrooms. A guy by the name of Gordon Wasson, I discovered... Uh, was running the CIA's MKUltra subproject 58, and the Huxley family was heavily involved in uh, the promotion and engineering for the CIA of the uh, MKUltra program. And I, uh, we had Wikipedia updated <clears throat> to reflect Gordon Wasson's participation in the CIA's MKUltra subproject 58 program. Uh, I had a, a doctor on my show, a guy by the name of Dr. Colin Ross, and he had given me the lead, and I had gone through and verified all of the citations and the, pulled all of the original uh, documents from the CIA FOIA requests and found <clears throat> that indeed Wasson was, a, you know, uh, MKUltra subproject 58. And then this was all updated on Wikipedia, and then immediately... Uh, all of this was edited out and they tried to water it down and change the facts. And, you know, and then it had to be, you know, because I'm an independent researcher, then it had to be uh, published under an academic to get, you know, official recognition that the work was correct. You know, I don't need an ad veracundium fallacy to know that the research is correct. I can check the citations. I'm a forensic researcher. I know how to look things up and verify it. And I was able to well prove uh, through several, you know, extensive articles that this was the case, but Wikipedia and uh, whomever was in there, as soon as it, they realized that it had been edited to reflect that Wasson was indeed uh, CIA, they went in there and quickly edited it. You can go in there and see all the edit history of, of what they've done to play this down, et cetera. And, you know, th they still uh, won't allow you know, information to be published about Aldous Huxley, Julian Huxley's involvement in all of this stuff, you know, and uh, they were, they were the guys creating the blueprint for the entire operation, not warning people against it, like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World is one of the key blueprints of the whole operation. So anyway, you know, and I want to get into cannabis with you later, and that actually flows into uh, some of the research that I've exposed on that. We even did a show on this topic, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. Yeah, I mean, look, this is the, you know, this is why um, 
my running for U.S. Senate as an MIT PhD, as a guy who's actually created thousands of jobs, you know, the building I'm in, I have no debt on, it's my building, I bought it in 2002, we run our own data center. So I've run, you know, seven very successful companies. Massachusetts is supposed to be the center of innovation, right? MIT and Harvard. But we keep electing people, or, or, it's supposed to be a representative democracy. You have people, uh, a guy called Markey or Malarkey, you have Warren. These are the kinds of people that are being elected. So it really comes down to the fact that the electorate, voters in particular, have an opportunity in 2020, particularly in Massachusetts, which I consider the epicenter of, if you believe this thing called the deep state, it's not Washington, DC, it's Massachusetts. Massachusetts is where all the, um, you know, sort of the swamp creatures get created and incubated, et cetera. And the, the great opportunity I've had is, you know, I've, I've, ex I've experienced extremes. You know, I grew up in India at, uh, in an environment where we were considered low caste untouchables, right? Uh, where you won't find a lot of Indians like me. And, and most of the Indians in the United States are frankly quite racist uh, because they always try to figure out what my last name is because they themselves are quite um, segregationist, racist people. And I say this with all, uh, you know, factual uh, reality of what I've experienced being into your here. So you have that phenomenon. You have the fact that uh, because I worked hard, because I probably had certain very good uh, genetics that came from both my parents who were very hardworking people, I busted my balls and I, uh, you know, won every award in high school, was also a great athlete and also uh, made it to MIT. And so, and beyond that, I was able to, you know, have the opportunity to only in this country to create jobs and start companies. And I continue doing that. So what better person to represent Massachusetts than me? And when we ran last year against Warren, you know, we ran initially as Republicans. The Republicans were so afraid of me. They ran an idiot. We call him Dirty Deal, who actually photoshopped a picture with Trump. And when Trump doesn't like this guy. So the rhinos ran a fake Trumper. And there was Warren, a fake Indian and a, and a fake Trumper. And we ran as independents. We got close to 100,000 votes, five times more than any independent senator, Senate candidate has ever gotten, raising, and, and I think we spent less than 70 cents a vote. Warren was spending about 20 to 30 bucks a vote, and the Republican, five bucks. So, you know, and we did some quite incredible things on the innovation side in running a campaign. So this time I'm going to run as a Republican. And uh, they don't have this rule that they had last year. Um, so they're not going to be able to keep me out unless, obviously, if they try to change the rules. So it's a big opportunity, I think, not only for Massachusetts, but for this country to have someone like me, who is an absolute embodiment of the American dream, rep uh, American dream represent them. And uh, the good news is that, you know, I'm articulate. I know what I'm talking about. But more importantly, I've seen both sides. You know, I've been in the bowels of academia. You know, I've been in Hollywood, you know, I just finished a, I know, you know, that entire environment. And uh, when you look at celebrity culture and you look at academic culture, they're not that different. You're looking at highly insecure people, people with very little talent, most of them. And I, by the way, I distinguish that between real scientists and real artists or real actors, a very different group of people. The academic is essentially a salesperson. He's not that intelligent, not that smart. They're essentially... Um, ready to do whatever their prostitutes for whatever grant is available and same with celebrities uh, same type of culture and the reason I think when Alan spoke to you we wanted to call this a climate of science is that I have a very very deep insight into where the country for that matter the world is going if science uh, degenerates to where where it's headed because the fake news behind the fake news is really fake science because well, the journalist today was, essentially, yeah, sorry good the journalists essentially cut and copy uh, citations. So the way it goes is a quote unquote of an academic can write a paper. The fake news guys cut and paste that and then it becomes fossilized on Wikipedia because Wikipedia has nothing to do with truth. Wikipedia is citations. So I could write an article on some um, journal somewhere saying, you know, you beat your dog. And then I could go to your Wikipedia page and said, yeah, he beats his dog and cite you, cite that article. So we have a flow of information now ultimately the issue is that all of these people cite an academic so john kennedy gave a very very interesting talk in the 1960s to the national academy of sciences and he said you know we have a problem in a free society because the problems of the world have become very sophisticated 
and we today rely on you, and he was speaking to the scientists, and we're assuming that you're disinterested and you're objective, and you are there for the public service. Well, the fact is that the real scientists have been filtered out starting around probably the 60s, 70s, and what you have is you have a bunch of lemmings called academics They get rid of the real smart guys, the people who wanna raise hell, because a scientist is ultimate, ultimately a revolutionary, because science is always pushing the edges. Um, rarely do you have great science coming from people who support the status quo. So they've gotten rid of all those people, primarily. That's, that's exactly what I've seen in my own research. And, you know, what you see is this pattern with these very often uh, tenured professors where when you, when you find three or four of them citing each other rather than citing the primary citations, this is when you know you've hit on an academic fraud and then you dig down into the primary citations there and you realize that there's nothing there to substantiate the claims or in fact the primaries show the exact opposite of what they are claiming. And I've found this, you know, uh, time and time again and I, you know, I've, I've written about academic cells and whatnot. And in my own opinion, you know, probably most tenured professors are on the take to mislead people and clearly the peer review system is nonsense. It's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, there to get, uh, you know, for, for approval of, of valid research. It's truth by consensus. And these people are there to keep out any dissenting opinions so that the status quo is maintained. And then you see uh, issues with the scientific method itself and about nine months ago, we did an, an episode uh, destroying the scientific method and, and calling to bring in the rational scientific method, totally overhauling uh, the uh, scientific method because of all of this. But, you know, most people don't realize that when, you know, most people are used to citing second and third hand sources, and that's the limit of their intellect. They don't ever think, hey, you know, I can go and fact check the primaries on this research. I can go dig up 15th, 16th century documents or whatever the case may be on whatever the topic, verify things and find out the truth of this and I can question these professors. And so what I discovered over and over again was uh, in just about any field I looked into, I could find these circle jerks of, of academics as you call them, uh, citing each other and not the primaries. And that was, as, as soon as I saw that, I, that sig signaled where I should dig further to be able to prove or to reveal or expose their fraud. Yeah, I mean, when you look, if you go to the, the, the thing with the scientific method, since, you know, by the way, uh, I think we, we may have mentioned, but I have a book called coming out called The Climate of Science. And I go through this in, in detail. But, um, the, the scientific method is supposed, there's two, by the way, when people discuss the scientific method, they're all, they only discuss one part of it. But the scientific method in its, in its purity should go like this. You have an observation, right? You see apple falling from a tree. Um, there's two parts here. One is you keep you seeing the apple fall from the tree, right? And that's called a recurrent pattern. And from the, observing that recurrent par pattern, you then come up with, a model, right? So you can say, well, the apple falls to the earth and the force between the apple and the earth, I, you know, you, you say the pattern is, you know, um, some gravitational constant G times the mass of the apple times the mass of the earth divided by, let's say, R to the power of three, okay? Which we know is not right. And then- Or, you do or is it pressure and that's a whole other issue altogether. <laughs> right, right, but pressure is force per unit area. But you, you do that. And then you come up with a, 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 a model that's starting to match this, this recurrent pattern. And maybe you tweak it to G you know, times M1 times M2 over R squared, which is, by the way, a Newton's law, right, of, of gravitation. So that becomes a law then. But even when you have a law, you're supposed to keep testing. But there's another part of the scientific method which is left out of the discourse or even in AP you know, physics, they talk about it, but they don't really emphasize it, which is from that observation, not only do you build an understanding of a model and a law, but you also are supposed to do something else, which is come up with an explanation. So the law is the what is occurring, 
but the explanation is why it's occurring. That explanation, also called a hypothesis, may lead to a theory, like the theory of relativity, right? Which explains gravity or attempts to explain gravity. So you have a law which comes out, which is one part of the scientific method, and you also have a theory, the why. And it's not just a theory. It, the theory in many ways is much more stronger because it actually explains the underlying of the law. So there's really two aspects of the scientific method. But the key thing is, you know, Einstein said, you know, um, it's not how many experiments prove my theory, but all I need is one experiment that could blow away my theory. And, but the nature of the scientific method was there was supposed to be constant experimentation, constant skepticism, constant discourse, constant you know, free speech. That was the underlying basis of the scientific method. It was never supposed to be based on something called scientific consensus, which is total BS. Um, it doesn't matter if 99% of the people believe the earth goes around the sun. All you need is one person clearly demonstrating that the, you know, um, I'm sorry, the sun goes around the earth, but all you need is one person demonstrating the earth goes around the sun. So what's great about when the scientific method actually works, it has nothing to do with democracy. It has to do with something uh, beyond politics. And so when you look at the climate of science right now, uh, it's not only with climate change, which we can talk about, but you look at every major issue, you know, in the book, we go through 17 different issues from climate change to healthcare, to the economy, to cannabis, to immigration. Uh, and we show how on each one of these issues, the establishment tries to break people up into left and right, which means you must be a lefty if you're against Monsanto. You must be a righty if you're against the climate change doctrine. You must be a lefty if you're pro-cannabis. You must be a righty if you're, you know what I mean, et cetera. And when I went through these issues and actually applied engineering and science as a guy who's got four degrees from MIT, and I want to emphasize that because uh, engineering, uh, what's powerful about engineering is you can't BS people. You know, you, you build a piece of software. If it doesn't work, you can't talk your way out of it. You're going to lose customers. You build an airplane. It doesn't work. You can't BS people. But academics can draw some curves and BS people. But what's powerful about engineering, what's powerful about what a plumber does or an electrician does or a nurse does, is they're always having to work with nature's laws. So what's happened with climate change, for example, is... If you follow the scientific method, it doesn't make any sense at all. None of the models match reality. In fact, the basis of science is a model, if, if it mimics reality, should always have a consistent prediction. So if the apple falls from the tree, right? And let's say one model said the apple would be suspended in the air two feet, and another one says at five feet, another one says 10, and the other one says uh, you know, it'll hit the ground, uh, that's called indeterminate. But when you look at the climate change nonsense or the climate change models, you have, for the case of, for example, ice melting from the Arctic, there's 40 different models. One says no ice will melt. Another says 100% will melt. And there's various flavors of it. That's not science. It's called indeterminate. And same with the 120 models that they have for the prediction of how CO2 will affect temperature. Again, 120 different models. So we're dealing in a situation right now where the people who are climate scientists, which by the way is a bogus field, there's no field called climate science, it's, it's completely created. The fundamental area of climate is fluid mechanics, two turbulent fluids, the, the ocean and the atmosphere interacting together to use convection to dissipate the excess heat. Now, first of all, that's one of the most difficult things to model because we don't even have a solution for the Navier-Stokes equation for a turbulent fluid. And you're talking about two turbulent fluids. So the whole thing has been completely manufactured. Why? In order to make people like Al Gore extremely wealthy off carbon tax. So on the one hand, you have the American worker over here. Over the last 20 years, his wages have dropped. You have the academic and the, you know, the administrator at a university. Major, their incomes have gone up by three times. And these people are proliferating all sorts of narratives because they get funded, they get paid, which ultimately extracts a pound of flesh from the American worker. That's what's going on, is the ultimate of exploitation. And it all emanates out of this one mile radius I'm at here at between MIT and Harvard. So you go to the next issue, you know, cannabis, right? My uh, sister, you know, was a pothead all her life, destroyed our family. Um, you know, now she claims she's one of the big pot doctors promoting how cannabis can solve everything. Right. But the reality is that cannabis of today is 
nothing like the cannabis that, you know, Lord Shiva smoked again in the Hindu Kush mountains, okay? That was one to one THC to CBDs. We're talking about 80 to one THC to CBD levels. We're talking about 25% THC. Uh, the, the joint today is a delivery engine for THC, just like the cigarette was a delivery engine for nicotine. Prior to the 1800s, very few people died of tobacco. They started mixing both tobaccos. They started layering in uh, things like Coumadin as a delivery engine. That's what modern uh, the joint is. It, and, you know, and you molest the plant, you basically uh, are destroying the plant. You know, it's only the female plant that they extract, keep all the, I mean, you, you go through what is being done as a complete adulteration of nature. And it gets even more interesting. You know, all these, you know, idiots like Ocasio-Cortez and Malarkey, who's Ed Markey, who's their associate, who we're running against here. These people are say, uh, saying that they want to support a thing called the New, New Green Deal. By the way, Ocasio-Cortez's advisor, senior advisor, was the head of the biggest cannabis lobby. If you go to Washington, <laughs> State, if you go to Washington State right now, the amount of cannabis that they're growing there will require an entire another Grand Coulee Dam. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> they're growing cannabis not in the wild. It is grown in these hermetically sealed, right, uh, greenhouses. One gram of cannabis requires 2.08 kilowatt hours, 100 times more than one gram of aluminum to manufacture. So this is what the reality is. You know, uh, an idiot wearing a new, a new Green Deal t-shirt or Green New Deal t-shirt smoking his joint, and behind him is going to be a bunch of, you know, pollution plants because you don't have enough energy even to power the production of cannabis from solar or whatever, you know, wind. So the whole goal here is to lower pollution. That's never discussed in this. The Absolutely. Paris Accords, Paris Accords increase, allow China to dump another 11 billion more carbon metric tons. They're already at 11 billion. They get to go to 22 billion by 2030. And what that means is more lead, more sulfur dioxide. CO2 is not a pollutant. You have to be an idiot to think CO2 is a pollutant. Absolutely. In fact, we're at two levels ever in the history of the earth until 300 million years ago. So the reality is we all want to lower pollution. In fact, that's not discussed. In fact, you have the most insidious companies like Monsanto supporting the climate change doctrine. Why? Because they want to push out more of their pesticides, more of their genetically engineered foods. And Absolutely. Um, so, so that's what, the, that's what the book really shows that the real enemy of the people, like was the enemy of the people in ancient India or modern India, was the upper caste people who thought they were better than the, less to, the rest of what we call sudras, you know, like the N-word. And in America today, you have the elite academics who are telling everyone else how they want to help minorities, how they want to help the poor when they are the royalty of the modern world and they need to be dethroned and what better place to do it than massachusetts because they are the enemy of the people ultimately you know there's two billion dollars in climate change grants you could be a, a moronic stupid professor write anything saying climate change causes bed bugs and you'll get funded that's what this is about and so they have made academics prostitutes they will write anything to promote a doctrine which is really about extracting more taxes and it's an insurance against us that's what it really is and when now, you unravel that yeah well i wanted to uh mention or disclose actually that from uh about the age of 20 uh onward for a number of years i was the inland empire coordinator for the california hemp initiative i worked on prop 215 to legalize medical marijuana and uh you know, once it was legalized, I looked back and looked at what they were doing and the uh, wax hits and the this and that and the, the vapes and all of this stuff. And uh, I was shocked. That's not what we fought for. You know, industrial hemp was supposed to make the world greener and better and yada, yeah, yada. But, you know, right. looking, looking back, I've come out against most of the cannabis and hemp movement, uh, you know, except for you know, maybe uses clothing and whatnot. But yeah, you're exactly right on the levels of pollution that it causes and, and you know, all of this well, stuff. But Well, THC, you have to understand, compete, our bodies for 500 million years, even in invertebrates, have the endocannabinoid system. What is that? That is a system where a body generates uh, at least two that we've identified endocannabinoids. You don't need weed for this. So right. our body has the right level of fats, when you relax and you, you live in a secure environment, your body actually makes endocannabinoids. Well, and they've got, every, they got everybody on a low-fat diet now, too, that's screwing everybody exactly. up, too. 
Right, the one to one, omega three, so omega six is when it's one to one, your body uh, creates endocannabinoids. And by the way, I'm saying a lot of this with a deep understanding of we've gone through around 10,000 pieces of literature, we've mined the molecular pathways with this new technology, we've actually have understood at the molecular systems level that the THC affects the CB1 receptor, and we can conclusively show, we're gonna be publishing some papers on this, we can conclusively show the mechanistic reason how high dosage of THC either for the acute person who, get, who takes a lot of it or the chronic person who's smoking it over long periods of time, how it essentially can lead to psychosis and schizophrenia. Now, will it affect everyone? No, just like there are some people who smoke cigarettes all day, live until 120, right? But if you are a young kid and you come from a family who has a history of psychosis and schizophrenia, it is disastrous for you to even smoke the stuff, period. If you are a young person and neurogenesis is taking place until you know, you're 25 years old, which means your, your brain is still growing, and it, it, it's again stupid. Parents are idiotic to let their kids smoke it because you're basically destroying the brain. Now, those people who think they're okay, the more and more data, you know, the amount of emergency room visits is doubling every three years uh, from cannabis-induced psychosis. And yep. this is not just this is, this is not just conspiracy. That's what's actually going on. Marlboro just put in $2.1 billion last year into the cannabis industry. Why? Because they're losing sales in nicotine. So they're going to move to another industry. And you have to understand, just like alcohol and um, liquor, you only need 15% of heavy users to make a very, very substantive, profitable industry. So alcohol, all you need is 15% of people doing eight drinks more than a day, which is what they have, and you're a very profitable industry. The goal of the cannabis model right now is to identify those 15% of heavy users, which I already have, by the way, and sell the hell out to them and get them hooked when they're in early age. It's tobacco version 2.0. Yeah, and, and, you, and now, you see you, it being promoted all over can, uh, California now with uh, you know big freeway billboards and this kind of stuff promoting uh, get your weed here and there, and you know you can you can buy this stuff just about anywhere now. Yeah, the issue is it's not you know it's it's. Uh, you know, here, here's my solution to both of the issues we've talked about. Let's go to academia and if you want, I, mean, I have very clear definitive solutions and they're very practical solutions. If you go to academia, number one, we need to eliminate tenure. In any federally funded institute, no more tenure. You can't have a job for life, get out and work, go teach. You know, uh, don't, don't, go, go build something. And we should bring industry people into academia because they actually know stuff. The second thing is any federally funded institution, you know, which is getting federal dollars, um, you know, at, at any at any level uh, like this, all their research from the time you get the dollar should be open sourced, which means the data. See, what happens is a, a young professor comes and he wants to get tenure. He's got seven years to get his tenure. He gets a government grant. He doesn't give all of his data away. That's where the manipulation takes place. If you do an experiment, you got to put that data up in the cloud. I should be able to do it. Uh, citizen science, you should. Citizen science. There are a lot of smart people. They're not just said again at MIT and Harvard and Yale. There's a lot of people in their basements who actually have uh, good skills and they can do stuff. So all the data should be published. Go try to find any of the climate change satellite data. You can't even get it. It's very difficult. I should be able to download the data and run my own analysis on it, write my own publications. Third issue is no more peer review. Einstein did not publish one paper under peer review of his 300 papers. Of his last paper that he submitted, um, to, I think the physical review, they said, you know, physical letters or something, we want to do peer review. He goes, give me my paper back. What are you talking about? He goes, anything new, why should it be peer review? Because your peers are the first ones to attack it and put down innovation. So anything that's federally funded should be published. Let, let the entire public decide and let it be refuted openly. So what we've created, so if, you, if we do just those three things, it's going to be a big necessary stab in the heart of academic monopoly. That's the first thing we should do. When it comes to something like, you know, uh, you know, cannabis, you know, my view is it should be decriminalized. You shouldn't be throwing people in jail. You want to do anything in your own home, go kill yourself, do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. But when you want to live in this society and integrate, interact with other people, not knowing that you're getting 25% THC and it's going to affect you and it's going to affect others, it's absolute reckless. Well, it, so you I know, don't think it should be legalized. In fact, legal Legalization has actually led to the, a massive black market that the prices have gone further down and, 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 it, and it's created more accessibility to everyone. Well, and I yeah. think cannabis causes, be getting it. I think cannabis causes half the problems they claim it uh, eliminates as well. 
Oh, yes, that's uh, totally bullshit. Yeah, my sister's out there telling people it's an exit drug. It's nonsense. Yeah. And when you actually look at the data, you know, 90% of the people on heroin and other th opiates all, you know, smoke cannabis at some point or had cannabis. And what's fascinating is when you start talking to these young millennials and, and telling this, I had a volunteer we got rid of, you know, he was telling me, oh, well, it's my opinion. You know, I don't agree. I, I said, what the fuck are you talking about? If I can use that language, your opinion doesn't matter. Science doesn't give a damn about your opinion or your beliefs. Science is based on actual reality. And you're talking to a person who, who's never studied chemistry, who doesn't understand what a kinetic equation is, doesn't understand what a receptor is. So that's a level of degeneration that's taken place. We have people who know nothing about science telling how their opinions matter. Opinions don't matter. What matters is let's support this, the real scientific method and let's find out what's going on. And if we don't know stuff, we should have the courage to say, hey, we don't know. There's uncertainty. So we haven't done that. Instead, you have politicians and celebrities and academics, this triumvirate coming together to push agendas, either for their own popularity or to manipulate the average everyday worker who's busting his balls to put uh, and, uh, you know, money, money on the table for their family. Those are the people who are getting manipulated by fake science. So, you know, I've talked about climate change. By the way, climate does change. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases do cause the temperature to change and humans put out greenhouse gas. That's not the issue. The issue is how much. That is the purpose of science. Well, well and, and it's all, you know, CO2 or carbon is also the foundation of all life as well. Yeah, and we have the lowest levels of CO2 in the history of the planet until 300, 300 million years ago. We were at a CO2 famine. Look, I was at a Andover, Massachusetts, a very elite neighborhood. They had a library talk with some Professor B who runs a center on sustainability. By the way, inclusivity, sustainability, and diversity, you can get money for it all day long, right? While you're actually probably the most racist people and probably the most anti, uh, uh, you know, nature people promoting pollution. That's what's fascinating. But here's his professor standing. Well, uh, the Toyota Prius is a perfect what? example. Sorry about that. I was just saying the Toyota Prius is the perfect example. Yeah, you yeah. have all the battery systems and electronics and everything. And, and these people, you know, that drive the Prius, they always have, you know, 90% of the time, they have a huge traffic jam behind them because they're so aloof and inconsiderate of everybody else on the road. And they're eating their, their tofu burgers and wearing their Birkenstocks and causing more pollution than they're solving because of this, you know? And I don't know if, you know, just on a side note, I don't know if you're aware of abiogenic oil, but, uh, you know, it's the, you know, there's a whole scandal around petroleum as well. Mm -hmm. Look, if we, we want to be serious about solving things, we have to take, we have to respect engineering. One thing about engineering, everything around us, this communication that we're doing right now, the iPhone, all of this stuff came from people's names we don't even know who busted their balls doing day-to-day -day tasks to create things. Engineers are ultimately the people who have the opportunity to advance life. If we want to be serious about um, you know, lowering pollution, we should be treating fusion, not fission, but fusion like the Manhattan Project because we have enormous amounts of seawater and that's what we should be focused on. Not like building windmills, not like building solar cells because these things cannot in the 21st, 22nd century, meet any of the energy demands we need. You know, we should be looking at materials like hemp, right? Real, real hemp, because it is, the graphene can be extracted from hemp, is stronger than steel. But we, we're focused on, you have this whole plant, we're taking one little piece of it, which is to destroy the youth of this country, and we're not focused on the entire plant. The plant, you know, has many, many powerful uses for creating you know, whole different types of biocomposites, but we don't do that, right? We focus on the most degenerate aspect of the plant. We molest the plant for Correct. human molestation and degeneration. I mean, I'll give you another example, gun violence, right? I'm a systems guy, you know, I, I've been trained in an engineering systems approach to anything. Um, how many people die of gun violence, do you know, in the United States every year? Oh, I looked it up last year, but it's not very much, you know, when you, you know, put it in. Thousand. Okay. 40, and, and, and a lot of those are, are uh, in, in self-defense as well. And what is right, it, so, uh, say, you know, for every crime, even, eight crimes are stopped by guns as well. Right. So that's not included in that equation. But let's even give it to them, to the mainstream media, 40,000 people. How many people die of sepsis, you know, which is where you get a bacterial infection in your body and you die? 40,000 people. Okay. 
cause in typically in hospitals, et cetera. So you have 40,000 people die of sepsis, 40,000 people die of gun violence. How much research is funded for sepsis? Very little. Uh, no, hundred times more than gun violence research. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. And there's about 120,000 papers written on PubMed. So, you know, we understand how sepsis works, blah, 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 blah. How much research have we funded in gun violence? Well, a tenth, a, a fraction of that, a one hundredth of that. You know how many papers? If you type in gun violence on PubMed, by the way, PubMed is a site for all scientific literature. Sure. You'll find about 400 sure. papers. 400 papers versus 120,000 papers for, for a, a, a phenomenon that causes the same amounts of death. Now, among those 400 papers, which by the way, I've gone through, um, there was one great paper, one of the few that was a systems approach saying, let's really look at this problem holistically, done by a woman, a multifactorial problem. And what, what she discovered was that there are five issues that cause these rampages, five. One of them being bullying, one of them being, you know, you know something's wrong with the kid, but people ignore it. Another one of them being drugs, one of them being, you know, violence. And the fifth one being access to weapons. And her research showed that if you just eliminate any one of them, not all of them, just one of them, you can stop these rampages. But we choose to take that, we choose only to say no more Second Amendment, right? Instead of saying, oh, what about good family structure? Why don't we impose that? What about, you know, trying to ensure that you see a kid who's a little bit off, the teachers get involved and they try to address it. What about putting in, you know, eliminating these psychotropic drugs? But we focus on one of those five, knowing that any one of the other four from this research can uh, eliminate it, right? Right. So and, we and don't you know, Prozac, et cetera, is a huge problem with these uh, mass shootings. Yeah, because right when you come off of it, you get, you get, so, and again, who supports this? Harvard School of Public Health. Okay, the academics get paid to create whatever narrative, and they are the elite academics. So the same academics, uh, Dick Lindzen, who I've recently come to know, great guy, uh, scientist at MIT. In fact, not only was the scientist, he was the head of the department for 20 years, the meteorology department. I had done a video many three, four years ago exposing the Paris Accords. It, it, it's, it's a very popular video if, you, if people want to punch it in. But Dick had, uh, Professor Linton had written to Trump saying, get out of the Paris Accords. Very, very senior, senior you know, serious physicist, serious, astro, you know, a, a fluids guy. And the other 120 professors wrote to Trump denouncing him. Well, I asked Dick, what's going on? I go, Shiva, MIT gets 20 to $40 million in government grants. That's what's, excuse me, that's what's really going on, okay? What's really going on is climate change is big business for academia, big business. And then you have idiots like Schumer trying to pass a bill in Congress, Bill 792, which, which is telling people, uh, which is trying to pass a bill which says no more discussion can be fostered by any government institution on climate change because of the scientific consensus. That is no different than the Council of Trent that took place, which were the edicts that you know, um, uh, attacked uh, Galileo. So you take issue after issue after issue, the real enemies of the people are the academics. And that's who we need to go after because we throw Wall Street guys in jail, but have you ever seen an academic thrown in jail for writing a false paper? Why isn't that guy, Jonathan Gruber, who called people stupid, who was the architect of Obamacare, not in jail? He knew it was all nonsense. Right. So, well, it's um, like uh, that uh, study, it was a false study that came out a couple of years ago, last year, two years ago, these guys intentionally published a false study on dog rape and it got published in all of these uh, snowflake publications uh, you know for feminism and yada 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 and then they revealed that the whole thing was a fraud and of course you know they were testing to see if these snowflake journals would publish this nonsense paper and of course they all published it without issue and then you know these guys get sued for exposing how these journals were complete frauds. Yeah, and what's interesting is there are uh, Randy Sheckman, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. I think shortly after he won the Nobel Prize, he wrote a scathing article saying, you know, he said, look, I've been part of the system. So he profited from it. But he said, uh, you know, all of these journals are in cahoots and it's all about citations. Uh, for those of you who don't know how this works in academia, if you get your PhD and you want to become a professor, the way it works is you have seven years. So if you're let's say you, you get your PhD around, you're 30 years old or whatever, you have seven years by the age of 37 to get tenure. 
What tenure means is you have a job for life. You can never be fired. You get the best healthcare, better healthcare than any, any of us ever dream of, best investment um, you know, plans, et cetera. So during those seven years, these guys are trying to get tenure. Well, how do you get tenure? The way you get tenure is that you have to publish papers where you uh, uh, are seen as an expert in a specialized field. So if you say, I want to become the expert in aardvark, you know, the history of aardvarks, okay? Well, you have to publish a series of papers, but your papers, uh, even if you publish a thousand papers, doesn't mean you're guaranteed tenure. You have to make sure other experts in the aardvark field reference your paper. It's Absolutely. called a citation. Okay, so how do you get a citation? Well, you, that means you have to go to the five other experts and suck ass to them, yep. literally. Because if you don't suck up to them, they're not gonna cite you and you better cite them. So if you're a small, uh, if you're a, a, a really innovative ac a scientist, I don't wanna use the word academic, scientist, and you actually find some amazing theories of aardvark which bro blow everyone else's theories and you try to publish that and you don't reference the other guys so it's counter, you're never gonna get published, you're never gonna get tenure. So the entire system is called a suck ass model, sucking up model of getting your tenure. So the entire thing is incestuous. It's circular citations by and large, you know, once in a while something gets through, but this is why we haven't had any significant innovation coming out of science. We haven't solved any major. Are you, are, are you aware of who created the uh, current uh, university model? No, I'm not. Who, who did it? Thomas Henry Huxley. Whenever you oh, see okay. a scandal like this, if you if you track it down, you'll almost always find a member of the Huxley family behind it. Even though, you know, I know you're a Fulbright scholar, even uh, Leonard Holden Huxley was uh, behind the uh, Fulbright thing. But, uh, you know, it's like the Royal Society. Well, what, you, what, you find, what you find out with Fulbright, he's an interesting guy. You know, he sort of, Eisenhower, you know, first talked about the world military industrial complex. William Fulbright was the first one to use the word military industrial academic complex at a... Um, you know, at a college uh, talk that he gave. And, you know, he wrote pretty scathingly about it. So once in a while you get guys like this on the left or the right, you know, who actually tell some truth. But I think where we're at in, you know, in, in history right now is that 2020 is gonna be an important election because it's really about science versus malarkey. That's what it's really gonna come to. It's gonna be, do you, do you wanna believe in science and engineering? And what I mean by science in the, in the, in the broader sense is, people are actually committed to finding truth. The plumber and the electrician, they're, they, they have to do the right things. You know, Working people can never get away with BSing, right? Because they're never gonna get paid. But the people who BS people are the academics, the politicians, the celebrities. Those people can, they get way too much respect. And that cycle of malarkey, and by the way, the guy that I'm running against, his name is Ed Markey, uh, get that. So it's gonna be, um, you know, the scientist versus malarkey. And it's ultimately going to come down to the fact that do we want to stand up for the American worker, truly stand up for the American worker, or do we want to support a bunch of leeches? Because these leeches are surviving, their salaries are growing while the American worker salaries are dropping because they create false narratives on immigration, on healthcare, right? The whole healthcare model. I mean, you go into the entire foundation of it, it never talks about lowering cost. They've created an insurance model where there's a collusion between pharmaceutical companies there's, uh, and insurance companies and the big hospitals. They want to keep costs high. It's like a 50 cents hamburger, a friend of mine said, is selling for half a million dollars. You go to the, you go to the emergency room in a hospital, um, you get a 50 cents aspirin, the actual billing is around $50. That's what's going on. Because there are middlemen called GPOs, group purchasing organizations and PBMs, who make close to a half a trillion dollars by elevating these prices. But none of this is ever talked about. Right. So the real issue of our campaign is really uh, to hit hard. We, we got great experience from running the last one. So anyone who is a real Trumper, who really loves this country, you know, should support our campaign in whatever way they want, because we're going to have, we always have a lot of fun, by the way, on our campaign. You know, the last one, if you remember, was only the real Indian can defeat the fake Indian. This one is really about science versus malarkey. Someone said we should say only the darky can beat Marky, but you know, <laughs> I mean, I try to be a little more statesmanlike. Well, but, uh, you know, they, they uh, constantly uh, run off of uh, stuff like that. And, and meanwhile, you have terrible people that get in office like Omar or, or AOC, et cetera, that, uh, you know, don't belong there and are clearly pushing, you know, socialist agendas and undermining the, the uh, country. What do you think about socialism? 
Well, well, look, I'm a student. I've, look, I've actually, have you, have you read the Communist Manifesto? Have you read? You know, I have a copy of it and I haven't, uh, I haven't read it. I haven't sat down and read it, but I do have a copy. I've I've actually read, so first of all, look, these people are even, what I call even fake socialists in in many ways. If you really, really read the works of Marx, the first chapter of Das Kapital, basically, what Marx says is, look, each human being has a dream. And there are people who come to disintermediate that dream. And that's sort of the thesis. You know, it's an interesting humanist model. But in Das Kapital, um, Marx defines proletarians. Proletarians are working people. Let me define working people, which means they sell their labor. They actually get up in the morning, they go work. He defined another term called lumpen proletarian. Yeah, I lost you there for a second. Taste for. These were criminals. These were yeah, the, the second, I said, Marx defined proletarians. Did you hear that? Yep. <clears throat> the other definition Marx had was a different degenerate group of human beings that he called lumpen proletarians. The lumpen proletarians were people, or they're lumpen proletarian, people who didn't work, lived off the state, were basically scumbags, okay? Welfare recipients. He never defined them as proletarians, okay? Um, Lenin, you know, in state, in, in his speeches, he would he would quote Thessalonians, which said, those who do not work should, should not be fed. All right. This, so when you really look at, uh, you know, the, the, if, I don't know if you remember this guy, Steve Bannon, people ask him, what are you? He said, I'm a Leninist. Real Leninism was standing up. If Lenin were alive today, he'd be supporting Donald Trump. Same with Marx. These people aren't even socialists. They're freaking fake socialists. They are demeaning the, the, the concept of work. They want people unwilling to work to get paid. They yeah. want to elevate those on welfare. So well, it's like, who's this uh, Asian guy running for uh, president? He's and a he's a complete moron. He's a complete moron. Yeah. Okay? He, he, this guy's a complete moron. And, and then you got moron. Rogan and, and Jordan Peterson okay. and all of these clowns promoting him. I mean, I'll talk about it. Did you? Yeah, because Joe, you Rogan cut out Joe, again. Rogan, Joe Rogan is part. I said Joe Rogan is ultimately part of the establishment. Absolutely. Okay? Joe Rogan is the ultimate part of what I call the not so obvious establishment. Um, we can come back to that, but that's what Rogan is. You know, the, those, and you know, he's represented by the number one talent agency in the world. And um, so what you have to understand is that the, the, the establishment knows a trend and they immediately put someone fake like Joe Rogan to take advantage of that trend. That's what Rogan's all about. But when you go to the fundamental issues here, you know, with you asked about socialism real socialism is about working people which means the person who gets up the the real scientist the the nurse the you know the uh, the plumber the electrician people actually contribute value them controlling the means of production marx was against the distribution of money you know he would be against ubi the goal was work Working people, we should be controlling government and we should be owning the means of production. That's true socialism. So if you ask me, I support that, man. That's working people. Those are the people who came to vote for Trump, right? The people who voted for Trump were everyday working people who wanted to have power over their lives. They weren't these fake socialists. So these people don't even, Marx would be rolling in his grave right now. But the problem is we in America don't teach history anymore. You know, you have the right and the left. The right wing doesn't really... The, understand what socialism is so they get caught caught in this idiotic dialectic but the reality is working people people actually sweat people work people who risk an entrepreneur those people should have their say in government not people who are unwilling to work not people want to take advantage of this great country and if you say that and 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 they're presenting that as socialism right but ultimately it's basically keeping people in bondage you know yeah that's what it's about these people well, and, and just want, like the promotion of uh, cannabis and hypersexuality and and all of this other stuff, it's to keep people in bondage. It's uh, you know, Huxley's. Yeah, well, look, the, the guy who's running for you know the the Chinese guy. Look, the Chinese culture is all about hard working, right? You're not supposed to get free stuff. So this is a very clever way of trying to give people free stuff to get votes. It's like it's the ultimate of buying votes. It's a it's the most scumbag thing anyone can do. So are you a are you a white racist nationalist since you support Trump? Did did no, I look, lose? Donald Trump? Uh, um, look, I, I'm just being snarky, you know. No, no, no. In fact, I was called that because I spoke at the Boston Free Speech Rally. You know, I was called <laughs> white. 
supremacist Nazi. Donald Trump has disrupted the system. Um, many years ago, look, one of my uh, friends and mentors is Noam Chomsky, people call a lefty, okay? Trump, Noam and I were speaking in 2007, uh, 2000, sorry, 2009 when I got back from India, and uh, we were predicting someone like uh, Trump would come because the elites on the West Coast and the East Coast uh, were not paying any attention to the American worker. And that's what Donald Trump did. He messaged to that worker because these people are thinking the 1%, 2% of people are transgender and gay and their rights, whatever. I mean, it's like a small percentage of people. Their rights mattered more than people who did not have jobs, did not have health care. They were elevating issues which weren't concerned to the broad mass of people. And that's what Donald Trump did. And he disrupted the establishment because the establishment exists left and right to distract people from fundamental issues. And the fundamental issue is that working people should be, uh, uh, you know, have the opportunity to govern themselves. Working people, meaning those people actually work, sell their labor. And what we've created in this country are two sets of people, one set of a bunch of scumbags who move money around all day and another set of scumbags who don't work. And in between them are people of the middle class who actually work for a living and who have well skills. Said. And instead of, instead of elevating them and providing them infrastructure, we've created a very, very unfortunate system where in the United States right now, you have three economies moving at light force away from each other. You have 30% of the economy, which does not work for a living. In a country where there's so many freaking opportunities, so many opportunities, there no, everyone should be off their butts working. You have another 30% of people who are Uber drivers and doing freelance stuff, the gig economy. And you have another 30% of people actually get up and go to work. And those three economies are moving away at light speed away from each other. That's not a good situation because that's, that's a that's a basically a perfect uh, environment for creating a destructive environment. I mean, look, people who come to this country from elsewhere know what the value of this country is. If 30% of people are not working, you have to give them money to, to take care of them. Something is absolutely wrong. You're an absolute you know, person of at minimum low integrity for telling people I'm gonna give you stuff. No, tell people to get off their butt and go work, suffer, work. What's wrong with suffering? It's a good thing. We well, made it you know, out of the job. Millennials, you know? millennials need, out of the I was we just going to say, sorry, sorry. go people, ahead. Sorry. If people go to Africa and everyone should, and you, and you go into the, the jungles there, you see monkeys and you realize, Jesus Christ, I was out there w w with some of them, you know, scratching myself, living like an animal. But human beings made it out of that. Look at all the stuff we've created. And to deny people that opportunity to create stuff and innovate and create and work hard and give them stuff that is though that's going to help them. No, we move forward through struggle. That's how you, that's why immigrants do so well when they come to this country. Because when I went to India, I saw, you know, my aunt living in a little hut. So I knew I had a great duty to be here. I should work hard. So if all these people don't want to work hard, why don't we do an immigrant exchange program? Here's my solution for immigration. All those quote unquote illegal immigrants, okay? Some of them actually work hard, right? Why don't we tell them you get citizenship and the guy who wants to sit on his ass not doing anything, send him out to Guatemala or those other countries? Because clearly you've lost your right for citizenship because you think you can leech off this country. Because some of those illegal immigrants actually do work. I'm not talking about the people who are murderers and et cetera, right? Those guys should be shipped back. But people have to value how much enormous resource this country has. We have a $22 trillion GDP, double that of China, you know, seven times that of India. The resources this country has is quite immense. And anyone who has arrogance, like the some of the millennials who don't want to work, some of these people who are willing to, on welfare, they should just leave this country. I hate to say that because you do not value what this country offers. There are a lot of poor people throughout this world who, who have nothing and they would love to come. Here. Right. And, well, and, and, and what the uh, what the uh, millennials will do is they will say, well, they will blame the United States for why people want to come to the United States to make a better life on top of it. So they'll say, oh, well, it's because of, you know, they'll cite some malarkey like John Perkins, uh, you know, uh, confessions of an economic yeah, hitman. These, these people are living in these people are living in theory. It's all sort of talk. Right. It has nothing to do with reality of actually making something. I mean, most of these people are getting degrees in international law, like AOC or some nonsensical degree. You know, um, you know, I just got back from Argentina, 
quite interesting. Um, 30 universities, engineering schools, free. Now, why did they create them? They created them at a time for the working folks who were you know, working all day and they wanted to get educated so they could go at night to get degrees. And these people are in the, you know, I went to Tucumán in Argentina, which is one of the poorest provinces. And they invited me to come to talk about innovation, et cetera. You know, I was honored there to go. The governor invited me. These people want to just learn, man. They're so incredibly fortunate. They all work and then they go to school at night. So those people value what we have here. So people better get off their ass and stop being crybabies and start valuing what they have here. Because they have no idea of the immense resources that they're given access to. And the, you know, anything can go up, can also come down. When I first came to this country, some uh, young, uh, uh, my, um, I used to paint. You know, I learned how to paint from a Yugoslavian immigrant painter. Uh, and I used to do landscaping. And he said, you know, in America, you can go as high as you want and you can go as low as you want. And these people want to pull everyone down really low to the lowest le level of human excellence, you know, or to no excellence. So Absolutely. I, you know, it's, well said. It's, it's yeah. disgusting. It's disgusting. All of these people should go to my village in India and see how people suffer and, and they live. And they will realize why they should get off their butt and work hard and stop crying. Well, and, and what they cry for is, you know, safe zones and universities yeah. and, uh, you know, free handouts yeah, and, but, and, and but meanwhile, but meanwhile, many of those people live, you know, luxurious lives like Elizabeth Warren, making three hundred fifty thousand dollars, living in her five million dollar mansion, and talking about caring for people when she she's never in, uh, invented anything in her life except right. invent the fact that she's an Indian, right? <laughs> That's what these people are about. They're fake, and we have to stop giving these people respect. They should be, you know, wherever they go, people should expose them, attack them. The good news is this: this is the great news that I want to, is that the American worker who gets up every day and has to work has common sense. Those are the 50% who voted for Trump and those are the 50% who are not buying the nonsense of the fake science. Because the reality is, the good news is also this, the fake science, the academics, the only way they're surviving is by recruiting vulnerable elites. So what happens is an idiot goes to college to get some bogus degree, he ends up with $200,000 in loans, all right? Now, in order to, get out of there and get a job, what does he have to do? He has to get A's, right? And, and, and how does he get an A? Well, he people pleases his professor who's sucking up to other people. So the entire system is based on one ass sucking system. So you have these students ass sucking up to their professors and the professors are ass sucking up to the government to get grants. That's literally what's going on. And so by the time this kid gets out, he may have A's and B's because, and then he gets a job in some place where he's really unqualified to have a job and his employer has to retrain him again. That's what the actual funnel is going on among the millennial vulnerable elite. And that vulnerable elite are the ones who don't know any science, don't know any physics, uh, can say, oh, yeah, don't worry, THC is fine, it's my opinion, right? <laughs> so, no, that's what's going on. Yeah. But the average American worker, you know, a lot of the people come to our campaign, electrician, 60% of the people came to me were working class whites. They weren't white liberals. You would think the white liberals should support me. They weren't. That shows that they're the real racists. So what Absolutely. we have in this country is a huge opportunity. And that's why 2020 is going to be important because, you know, uh, there is an anthropologist who said it within the first 20 years of a country or the first 20 years of a, of a new, uh, you know, century is that court is a court, the trajectory of that um, country determined. And we're coming down to 2020. Either we could head, head into the dark ages of giving people free shit away all the time and telling people um, that we should become like China, right? Dehumanizing innovation, watching everyone. That's what China's doing. China's not doing innovation. They're doing dehumanization. Putting up 28 million cameras with retinal scan is not innovation. That's called dehumanization. So the vulnerable elites want us to follow that model of centralization of power Big brother doing everything for you, not unleashing the spirit of the individual to stand up, to suffer, and to rise up to their best. And so I think 2020 is going to be a very important election um, for, for the entire century. It's not just about, you know, uh, my election, but it's going to be, so a guy like me running, you know, I say this with all humility, is a huge opportunity for not only people in Massachusetts, but for this country, because I'm not, I'm not going to run again. It's the last time I'm going to run. So people want 
serious change. They got to stop complaining and they got to say, wow, this guy Shiva Ayadure is running. He came from nothing. He, he has an MIT PhD. He has actually real things. Why are we, this is like, you know, different between coal and diamond, you know? You want to choose an idiot like Ed Markey, who is built his entire career since 1876, sorry, 1976 <laughs> in the Congress? Or do we want fresh people who actually know how to make stuff, who have a history of doing stuff? And I think that's what it comes down to. The good news is the American worker gets this. The issue is, will the Republican Party allow me to reach them? And the only way to do it, do it is to go direct with, with guys like you. So that's why I'm, uh, I was uh, happy when Alan said we'd have a chance to spend some time with you today. Well, and I, you know, I really appreciated, uh, you know, I, I watched an interview that you had done with uh, Anomaly, I guess was the guy's name. And, uh, you know, I was a little skeptical at first. Uh, okay, you know, I used to be a, a network admin and, and whatnot. I was in IT for a while. I got burned out. I, well, what happened was I was sick for 15 years in and out of hospitals. And so I started this and started publishing books, et cetera, because I couldn't keep a job when you're throwing up all the time and in the hospital. So I was wow. able to, yeah, I was able to cure myself. And, and uh, you know, now I'm entering the, uh, the 11th year of the show, but it turned out that, uh, you know, grains are one of the biggest poisons in the human diet. So once I cut the grains out, and went to a high fat diet, suddenly uh, my health problems disappeared. So that was a big revel, you know, revelation for me. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it, you know, it is all about the struggle and, and building yourself up and, you know, going through the fight, not having handouts and, you know, safe zones and all of this kind of stuff, which is the antithesis. I mean, these people are creating a system of self-imposed slavery and where, you know, truth no longer matters. It's, it's uh, truth is by consensus. Yeah, the good, the, the good news is, that, I mean, you use the word slavery. The, 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 you know, the Climate of Science book, it basically uh, proposes to the reader that we have a choice to choose freedom or slavery. And that's what this is really about. And it's, it's a spiritual question, too. Do you want to be a free human being, stand up on your own two feet? Because, you know, systems, natural systems are quite resilient. You know, we're quite resilient. We can handle a lot. The earth can handle um, a, a lot, meaning that there are systems that have feedback systems that support. So these people would think, oh, we're going to destroy the earth. They're complete idiots. They, they don't understand natural systems. You know, a good bridge, it has a certain amount of wave, right? It knows how to handle, um, uh, you know, different types of wind. The, the, the stupid unnatural systems can't handle that. Natural systems can handle, they have resilience if we apply nature's laws, you know? So the issue is like, you know, you went through your health crisis, you figured out that ultimately comes down to understanding your body, what your body can take, eliminating these toxins that have never even existed in probably the history of, you know, evolutionary history for long, long periods of time, they never existed. So the issue is to eat as, as, as much as possible these natural foods, understand your body as a system. When I was a kid, my grandmother was a farmer by day. On weekends, she was a local village healer. She practiced India's traditional system of medicine. And what I've been fortunate to be able to do is a new company we started, Cytosol, and the educational institute we do called Systems Health. We actually teach everyday people how their body is a system, teach them the engineering principles of the body, connect it to traditional systems of medicine so they can figure out what works for them. Because there's no one diet, by the way. And ultimately, it's about personalized medicine, giving your body the right things at the right time, you know, for the right person. So these are very, very simple systems. And that's what medicine should be about. It should not be about talking people up on drugs all, all day long. But I think uh, I'm looking forward to this election cycle um, because um, we want to, you know, one of our big enemies is white liberals. White liberals are the racists. Absolutely. I agree with you. And, you know, I wish you the best of luck on your uh, campaign. And I've been to uh, Massachusetts a number of times in the last year and year and a half or so. And uh, it's overrun with liberal, liberals who then, uh, as California is, and then what happens is they bleed into surrounding states and, and alter. I, the, I think we should call them racist. I don't think we should. I think we should just call them racist. <laughs> That's what they are, because that's what they are, man. They are racist at the deepest level. They think working class white people are dumb. They're the smart ones. That's a form of racism, you know, yep. segregation. They think, you know, a dark skinned Indian guy couldn't invent email. That's a form of racism, right? 
Yeah, but absolutely. They, they want people to shut up and they want people to uh, follow their doctrines. That's a form of racism. I think calling them liberals is too nice because real classical liberalism was actually pretty good. They're actually just racist. <laughs> That's what they are. Well, well said. And uh, so Dr. Yeah. Shiva, you know, thank you so much for your uh, time today. I really appreciate it. Sorry for the struggle. Again, the uh, channel was uh, demonetized. Apparently the main channel, uh, they've also shut off the live feed, which I was not aware of. And uh, I'll have to test out what's going on. You know, even the backup channel, I checked it and it says that the uh, live feed is not shut down. So I'm not even well, sure why well, we can broadcast. This is why, you know, when you get a chance, this book won one of the small book awards. It's called The Future of Email. It's a different book I did a couple of years ago. One of the solutions I've proposed is that this, the First Amendment can only be protected uh, by we, the people, owning the infrastructure of communications. That was why Franklin and the founders set up the Postal Service. It wasn't just to send printed mail around. It was a foundation of the First Amendment, not just the Second Amendment. The Postal Service was set up so I could send you a piece of communication and no one could interfere. And if they did, it was 20 year sentence in prison. The Postal Service you know, I met with them in 1997 when I ran another company to do analysis of email, which was used to lower the cost of email processing by large companies. I grew that to around a um, you know, quarter of a billion dollar company, uh, did quite well. But in 1997, I met with the Postal Service and I said, look, you guys should offer a public email service in the spirit of what you were chartered to do. They thought, well, that's idiotic. We're in the mail business. We should do email. 2011, the Postal Service is going out of business. And I showed them that this would generate quite a bit of money for them because I believed an American would pay probably about 50 bucks a year to have an email service brought to you by the Postal Service, which would be protected. Forget encryption on all that. Anyone, Mossad can break encryption all day long. But the issue is, if I send you an email and anyone interferes with it, you could get a 20 year sentence in prison. So you have this way to actually stop intervention. What we did post 1997 when email volume overtook postal mail volume is, um, Gmail, Hotmail, all these guys started offering free mail, right? And we transferred our freedom for getting this free email and they own all of our email. So yep. we basically screwed ourselves as citizens. Forget them, we screwed ourselves because we stopped demanding that the Postal Service do their job, which is to provide the infrastructure to protect the First Amendment. So my very simple and clear solution, and it's executable, is that all those Postal Service Postal Centers, they put up an antenna. Okay, and it's called a mesh network. And that's a network not owned by AT&T or Verizon, et cetera, but it's owned by us as a people. And we all be given the capability where you can run your YouTube channel, you could, whatever, your, uh, your Facebook, et cetera, brought to you by the Postal Service, because that was their charter. It's part of the American constitution. So that's brilliant. That's what really, it's yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, initially people say, what the hell are you talking about? The postal service, because in their mind, well, it makes total just, sense when, when you break it down and think about it, you know, and you know, uh, Franklin, uh, you know, granted he brought us media mail and things like that to be able to ship books out all over the place for, for cheap. But, you know, unfortunately on his dark side, he did have like 15, 17 bodies in his basement, but uh, you know, it makes perfect sense that we would use the the postal service that they should have been the innovators of of setting exactly. up email systems and things like that, so that when you get hackers and whatnot in, involved in your email, then it's a federal offense. You know, that makes because look, we're not going to technology is technology is always going to be leapfrogging itself. You do this encryption, someone will beat it. You do this, someone. But the issue is, you need to have a body of law. That's why the postal service was set up. Anyway, so why why this, didn't why didn't they jump on this? Well, they did. They did. So when I so in 2011, I gave an interview to Fast Company and Time Magazine. It came out the Inspector General, you know, who oversees the Postmaster General, called me, Dave Williams, and he funded me to do two reports to show them how they could generate money. They gave me about 100k. I wrote two very very good reports to the postman, nothing has happened with that. Um, now I've notified through some context of the Trump administration they should do this. And you've start, suddenly started to see the Postal Service potentially may do something. But the bottom line is, you know, they have, they know these solutions, but you gotta understand that the deep state within the Postal Service, starting around Reagan's era, gutted the Postal Service and they gave all the stuff to FedEx and DHL. The Postal Service was destroyed uh, post Reagan. 
and they gave the, the, the best parts of it to private companies. So that's what really took place. So my view as a postal service is the infrastructure that is sitting right there. Uh, forget trying to, you know, uh, regulate Facebook and Google. It's never going to happen. And they'll always find another way out. We, the public needs to have its own infrastructure in that, and that is through the postal service. Anyway, I enjoyed the, the conversation. I hope uh, anyone out there, you know, our website is Shiva for Senate, and the, the book is The Climate of Change. I mean, The Climate of Science, sorry. Um, and uh, I think there's a link Alan may have sent you if people are interested in it. I think we're giving a, anyone who signs up early, we're giving them some uh, significant pre-order discount. But I think it's gonna be a great book because it's gonna be the handbook for change where people can read it, understand an issue, understand the left and the right views and what the real view is, or in some cases that we need to do more research, that some of these issues are not so easy to just put a single stake in the ground. All right, Dr. Ayadura, thank you so much for your uh, chat well, this uh, evening. Uh, I really appreciate it. Have a good yeah. evening and uh, maybe we'll have, have you back again sometime. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Be well. All right, bye-bye.